From the Commonwealth Club of California, this is Climate One, leading the conversation about America's energy, economy, and environment. I'm Greg Dalton. In the election, Hillary Clinton carried Orange County, along the hotbed of conservatism in California, and where Nick, Richard Nixon went to retire. California is now bluer than ever, and Republicans don't hold any statewide offices. But the country's biggest and bluest state is on a collision course with the emerging administration of Donald Trump. On immigration, trade, the Supreme Court, social issues, and fossil fuels, California and Trump's tower are on different planets. On the show today, we will explore how President Trump will get along with California, which has long shaped international culture and technology and is a bastion of progressive coastal politics. Can Republicans and Democrats find common cause around California roads that are used to truck toys made in China that are then slipped under Christmas trees around the country? Can Republicans and Democrats find common cause around California's water system that nourishes food that lands on kitchen tables, even in the heartland? Can Republicans and Democrats agree on anything else at all in the wake of an exceedingly nasty campaign fueled by anger, hate, and racism? Joining our live audience at the Commonwealth Club today, we're pleased to have with us two Republicans and two Democrats. Christine Pelosi is a member of the Democratic National Committee and a super delegate. Her mother, Nancy Pelosi, has led the House Democratic Caucus for 14 years. Tony Strickland is the California chair of a pro-Trump super PAC, the Committee for American Sovereignty. He served 10 years in the California State Legislature and is close to both Mitt Romney and Kevin McCarthy, the Republican Majority Leader in the House of Representatives. Duff Sundheim is former chair of the California Republican Party and a former member of the Executive Committee of the Republican National Committee. Earlier this year, he ran for an open seat in the United States Senate in a race that ended with two Democrats duking it out under a California's top two primary system. Tony Thurman is a Democratic member of the California State Assembly from Richmond, a city along the San Francisco Bay. He previously served on the Richmond City Council. Please welcome them to Climate One at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. Duff Sundheim, I want to start around uh, 2003, uh, when an entertainer who had not ever held <laughs> political office was elected uh, Governor of California, he came in, said he was going to blow up boxes. Right. Um, a lot of people were shaking their heads. And then the ironic twist, of course, here is that he is the new celebrity apprentice. He's right. taken right. Donald right. Trump's old job. So what right. parallels do you see between Arnold Schwarzenegger and Donald Trump? I think the main thing is that they are not ideological and they are not based on personalities. So what they're in terms of who's around them. So their focus is going to be on getting things done. For Schwarzenegger, the comparison was the movie. Okay, there's a finished product that we get out there and that we sell. For Trump, it's the realization that there is a product that is built, real estate, a building is built. So I think what you'll see throughout this process, and you've seen within the first three weeks, is it's about results. And he is putting on his team people that know how to get things done. And that big ego and big personality, in the case of Schwarzenegger, he had some difficult relations with his own Republican Party. Some people thought he was a party of one, and some people think Donald Trump is a party of one. That's right. I, I think that people that see him as an ideologue is wrong, but they are going to be susceptible to pressures that other politicians would not. I remember one time where Schwarzenegger came up with a big proposal and his daughter opposed it, and it got switched that weekend. So, you know, there, there are unusual um, factors that come into play as to how decisions are made. People trying to read those Trump kids, right? Where are they and what, how could they get to daddy? Uh, Tony Strickland, uh, is California on a collision course with uh, the Trump administration? No, I, in fact, quite the opposite. I, I think uh, you have uh, leaders in the Republican House, Kevin McCarthy being the number two, the majority leader. Uh, Jeff Denham uh, is in line to be the transportation infrastructure chair which Donald Trump has now said that there's ways on common ground on some issues and some issues there's disagreements. That's what happens in the legislative body. But I think Donald Trump's uh, investment in infrastructure, I think is going to be very important that hopefully on those issues that Republicans and Democrats from California can come together on some of those issues to bring some of those dollars back here to California. But we have, uh, you know, Ed Royce is chair of the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, so there's many uh, Californians that are in very important positions uh, back in Washington. And Daryl Issa, who just got across the finish line, is extremely close to uh, the new uh, president. So um, I think that uh, it, it is key 
that what we can do is work together, hopefully as a delegation, uh, not different than Texas. I mean, Texas sticks together a little bit more uh, <laughs> than we do here in California in terms of fighting for your state. And I think we, we should do that a little bit more here in the state of California. Long tradition of uh, Californians serving in both Republican and Democratic administrations. Ronald Reagan took lots of Californians, Condi Rice serving uh, George W. Bush. Uh, uh, Christine Pelosi, big fight recently in the Democratic caucus. Uh, your mom run again, but one third of the supporters, uh, one third of Democrats said that they wanted someone else. Is there time for fresh new leadership in the Democratic I think there is fresh new leadership in the Democratic Party, and you see that in the number of people that were appointed or nominated. Uh, yes, my mother, Nancy Pelosi, won overwhelmingly, which was terrific. As she said, they won. She would win by two-thirds. She won by 68%. She knows how to count. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I, I never bet against her ability to count. Uh, and as one of five children, I know she can <laughs> see through a head fake. So... Uh, <laughs> So, so I tell you from personal experience, she knows how to do that and build uh, coalitions, some of which are will necessarily be transpartisan. And a lot of them come from younger members. Eric Swalwell from uh, uh, closer to your neighborhood, uh, Tony T, uh, is, uh, is a young member uh, in his 30s, came to Congress with a $100,000 in debt. She put him in charge of the future form. So we could talk about that debt, student loan debt, get out of the culture of shame and into the culture of talking about why it is that we have so much crippling student debt and what that means to people's personal economies and deferred dreams. So I think, you know, Eric's a strong example as a Sherry Bustos, a bulldog from Illinois, who's now on the communications message team, and Matt Cartwright from Scranton, Pennsylvania, where perhaps we could have done a little bit more campaign painting last month. Uh, so you will see fresh new leadership and a chorus of voices going out and reaching out to the American people. But a lot of the, the brand name Democrats from Elizabeth Warren to Chuck Schumer, et cetera, they're all in their 70s. Now, age discrimination is illegal in this country, but a lot of them are much more senior. And there's a question whether they're representing the, the millennials and the, and the younger, younger people. Is that fair? Well, I think that age is but a number. Look at Bernie Sanders. Um, mm -hmm. He's 75 years old and he was the darling of the millennials and remains mm -hmm. to be. So I think I look at Ruth Bader Ginsburg where people are wearing her notorious RBG uh, T-shirts and and, you know, waving coffee mugs. So I think we have to be careful when we talk about um, there's a difference between being old and being stale. So the California Democratic Party uh, used to be the executive director. The senior caucus head used to have a slogan, if you're lucky, you'll get old too. So I think we have to be, uh, mm -hmm. I think we want to be mindful of bringing all of the voices together, particularly when the first order of business of the new administration is supposedly to repeal Obamacare, throw 20 million Americans off health care, and to voucherize Medicare, which will deeply affect seniors. So if we start to say we can only put um, young faces out there, that may also say to America's seniors, we don't care about you. So I think you need to have a balance in age, a balance in ideology, a balance in race and gender and, and in, in every way so that you are a legitimate, authentic national party. And experience, too. Who, who more importantly to help us really beat back some of the, the awful things that we've heard from um, the president-elect about you know, repealing Obamacare than Ms. Pelosi, who has experience, who knows how to move within the caucus. Um, we should be focusing on her experience and her ability to help us push back where we can within the Congress. So Tony Thurman, you're in uh, this late state legislature in California. California has a Democratic governor, two thirds control in both chambers, uh, super majority. That means they can kind of do what they want. What's, what are California Democrats going to do with that cherished uh, power uh, in, in Sacramento? Well, let's just say I'm glad I'm in California, right? As we all are. Um, on election night, it was just devastating for everyone. And uh, when they said that the, the website for people who wanted to move to, Cal to Canada crashed, I was thinking that was probably just the people in Canada, in California saying that. We, we have the ability to push back on, you know, if Trump decides to cut funding for Medi-Cal, uh, we have the ability to shore that up through the budget. And having a two-thirds majority gives us the ability to do that. California has led the way in LGBT rights, protecting women's rights, immigration issues, education. And because of what's happened, we're going to have to continue to lead in all of those areas in California. And having the two-thirds majority will give us the votes that we need to protect everything that we've done to 
work against climate change, what we've done with SB 350 to make sure that we move away from oil and use more renewables. We're going to need that two-thirds majority to bolster what California can do and hopefully to be a shining example for the rest of our nation. Duff, sometime, what do you see as the areas of agreement uh, mentioned in the introduction, water, infrastructure? Where can Republicans and Democrats agree uh, in this new political landscape? Well, I think those are two of the major areas. But first of all, let me just correct one thing. Throwing 20 million people off of health care is not on the agenda and not what we're trying to do. Um, That's what would happen if you repealed the, repealed the Affordable Care Act. And, and didn't the, replace it with something else. I mean, but we have a system where we've increased the number of people in the state that are on Medi-Cal by 74% percent, and yet the quality of the health care that those people have been provided has not increased at all. So what I think what we're trying to say is that, look, it's not about spending money. It's about the health of the people. It's not about access to insurance. It's about access to quality health care. But you have to give them that. If you throw them off health care, they're not going to have that but kind of access. But that's what I'm saying, that there's no plan to throw 20 million people off of health care. Tony Strickland, well, in uh, Donald Trump's interview. By the way, that was a question on how we get along. <laughs> <laughs> that's an example. Just, this, I mean, this is an example. <laughs> Let's get right to it. <laughs> Tony Strickland, in, on 60 Minutes, Donald Trump said he would keep uh, two provisions of, of Obamacare. Yes. One is the, you know, uh, the one that people with pre-existing conditions and allowing people to stay on their parents' health care until 26. Uh, repeal and replace has now been replaced with repeal and transition. So they're walking it back a little bit. What is the path on, Ob on Obamacare? Because it's well, complicated. And it's going to take a no, no, it'll take Democratic votes on the replacement side. There's no question. Um, in, in the conference, you're never going to get all the Republicans to agree, just like you don't get the Democrats to agree 100 percent on certain issues within their conference. So the repeal uh, among the House uh, and among the Senate is there, uh, but it's the replacement side that, uh, quite frankly, if I was there, I would reach out to as many Democrats as possible to try to bring in a coalition to try to get something done on the replacement side. It Exactly with what? Because this is a system that's for profit based on for profit insurance companies. There's a mandate that people don't like. Well, uh, there's two I'll provisions. tell you, there's some there's some Democrats that that would that believe that uh, oh, quote unquote Obamacare doesn't go far enough. They they want more of a government run single payer single payer sure. system. Like, right. Correct. <laughs> yes. So uh, there's there's different factions within even the Democratic Party on what. But that that's looks not like. happening. What's the Republican plan? The, the Republican plan uh, right now is being drafted. I, I know uh, Paul Ryan is going through a lot of that, and the new um, Health and Human Services uh, appointment, Mr. Price, is, uh, Congressman Price, is going to be at the forefront. They're drafting that right now. Um, so, uh, but really, there's no final product because. Quite frankly, you're not going to have 100% Republican support on the replacement side. And quite frankly, you, you know, the members of the House and the members of the Senate on the Republican majority side are going to have to reach out to Democrats to get some input. It might be some of the blue, blue dog Democrats to bring them over to see what that final product looks like. Sometime, is it possible that this would be just a... Uh rebranded and that it would essentially under the hood, it would be basically the Affordable Care Act, but it would have some Republican uh, ornaments around it, that it would have some of the main elements because the Republicans have had uh, years to say what their alternative plan would be. They've repealed, voted to repeal Obamacare well, dozens of times in the House, and yet they aren't able yet to say what they're going to replace it with, because I think the replacement might be a lot like what they're replacing. Well, you know, <laughs> the conference football college championships are this weekend, and you can turn on any sports show, and you'll get these prognostications as to what's going to happen this weekend, and nobody knows. You don't know. okay. So we have a situation where we have a new head of uh, Health and Human Services, Price, that uh, Tony mentioned, who has an own plan that he has in writing. Now, how much of that gets adopted by the administration, we don't know. And then like when we had Obamacare in the first place, there was a certain set of ideas that Daschle came up with, and most of those ended up not being part of the legislation. So even though you may go in with an idea of where you're gonna take the program, once you get into those hearings, and as Tony mentioned, you get those votes, it's a, it's a by design, a process that will involve a lot of people. And Tony and I may end up agreeing with a lot of what's there, and we may be arguing that some of the things need to be changed. But it's going to be a healthy discussion, and it's a top priority for this administration. But isn't it dangerous to repeal something when you don't know what the plan is for what you're putting in place? Well, right, but there, nobody's saying that they're going to do that. I mean, if you, uh, what uh, President-elect Trump said on 60 Minutes is that we're not going to just Repl uh, re um, repeal it without something to go to. So that's what the 
baseline is well, that we're going to have they'll something be, be in place all the time. You're not going to find 20 million people without any place, any place to there'll get There will be legislation that is like a continuing resolution uh, as they're drafting this document to make sure that there's a smooth transition between the repeal and the replace. Right. Christine Pelosi, on infrastructure, that's someplace uh, unions would like a lot of those jobs. Uh, lot, the investment uh, is infrastructure. We all know there's crumbling roads and bridges in this country, terrible third world infrastructure in some places. Is that an area where Democrats and Republicans can agree? Well, let me take this to the issue of the American worker, because a lot of people talked about whether there was or there wasn't an economic message that came out or that was or that was heard through the clutter of the other elements of the campaign. Interestingly enough, I was at saw Hillary Clinton here in San Francisco and there was a crowd of 5000 people who gave her a standing ovation when she said, we're going to fix the electric grid. I thought that's because we're in San Francisco, <laughs> but they were giving that a standing ovation. So yes, there is a there is an absolutely a need for jobs and absolutely need a job jobs and infrastructure. But we have to start with talking to the workers, talking to the workers about the work that they do and what they need. So if by infrastructure we mean we're going to have a we're going to have a jobs plan that puts money in the pockets of workers, then yes, we can agree with that. But if by infrastructure plan you mean a tax credit for people who were already had projects in the pipeline, mm -hmm. that's not going to succeed because Democrats won't support it and a, a fair number of Republicans won't either. Um, I was interested by the title, Tony S., of your uh, <laughs> uh, American Sovereignty Pack, because I want to take this to trade for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, and the issue is, you know, most of us who oppose TPP and will forever lament the fact that the final year of Obama's presidency was, was based on Democrats, majority of whom did not support mm -hmm. TPP, um, and some people were on one side and another side on, yes, on that issue. Yes, having to then go out and tell American workers, we're putting you first, but our president's signature issue is something we don't like either because we don't think it involved you. I think you have to start with the workers. And that was our argument against TPP, uh, the Trade Prom um, Promotion Authority argument first, which is why are you having an, an agreement that does not protect American workers, health and safety standards, and climate standards that we fight so hard for here in California and here in the country. Why are we giving up our sovereignty, if you will, on those issues? So I think that when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to trade, when it comes to jobs, you have to start with the workers. On infrastructure, it's pretty simple. The American Society of, of Engineers has a list. Mm. They have a list where they've graded everything, you know, A to F. One of the Fs, by the way, was Doyle Drive mm. um, before the uh, Reinvestment and Recovery Act put the money in. Now it's a beautiful entree. It was like the third worst in the country. So I do think that there's a way to get along, but you have to start with talking to the workers and talking of uh, filling the need. And if people don't immediately see shovel-ready jobs, uh, that's going to fall apart. And I think the, the voters will rightly turn on Democrats and Republicans if we don't insist if you're on just, jobs. If you're just joining us, we're talking about infrastructure and the Trump administration and climate change. I'm Greg Dalton. My guests are, you just heard from Christine Pelosi, a Democratic strategist. We also have Duff Sundheim, former chairman of the California Republican Party, Tony Strickland, chair of a Calif California chair of a pro-Trump super PAC, and Tony Thurman, a member of the California legislature. Uh, I'd like to go ask Tony Strickland on infrastructure. Is this going to be new money into infrastructure and how's that going to happen without busting the budget? Well, I, I think you'll see a, a few different things. It'll, it'll be some new money um, and there has to be offsets, obviously, in terms of new money. Clearly, Donald Trump has built things his entire life. He looks at where we are in a crumbling infrastructure and he wants to invest in the crumbling infrastructure. And on top of that, you'll have public-private partnerships in a lot of these uh, areas. There isn't enough federal money to fix how far behind we are in terms of infrastructure. So he'll invest some public money into it, but he'll also uh, be innovative and come up with public-private partnerships. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, uh, on some of the trade issues, that's where uh, Donald Trump will agree a lot with some, some of the Democrats that maybe some of the Republicans won't be there. Um, you know, you're never going to agree with someone 100% of the time. And there will be policies that Donald Trump has that many of the members of the, uh, the Republican Congress may not support as much as others. That's I, yeah, just with respect to the infrastructure, I agree with Tony 100%, but there are also other sources of funding. One is going to be all the 
trillions of dollars that are offshore that are going to be brought back by the 10% tax on offshore holdings. And in addition, you're going to have what I call revenue bonds. So for water projects, there are people that will pay for the water. So that won't require uh, tax to be imposed on the people. You will have revenue that is generated from the use of that water, which will go to pay for those bonds. But one of the key things I'm concerned about, and a lot of people are concerned about, is whether California is going to get the same level of infrastructure spending because of our very onerous regulations on water, on roads, on the various infrastructure projects. You know, uh, Governor Brown has tried to do a transportation bill. He's not able to get that through. He's tried to do a housing bill, unable to get that through. So they're very strong, regulatory. We don't want to get things fixed. We don't want to build things in this state that are going to have to be overcome. And that's much more difficult to here than it is in the other 40 Which United means, States. I think what you're talking about is relaxing environmental regulations, possibly. So I want to go to, uh, we, a while back, I interviewed former Secretary of State George Schultz, who served as Secretary of Treasury under President Nixon, and also uh, uh, Secretary of State under Ronald Reagan. Uh, here is Secretary Schultz. So I had in creating the EPA, and I've watched it over the years, and it seems to me it has proven itself as a very useful nag to keep after us. And we have better, cleaner air, cleaner water. You would much rather breathe the air in any American city than breathe it in Beijing. Thank you, EPA. So that's George Shultz, former Secretary of Treasury under President Nixon and a cabinet member of President Reagan. Duff Suntime, thank you, EPA, but EPA is in the crosshairs of this new administration. Well, we don't know how that's going to play out, but uh, Secretary Schultz is one of my mentors. And one of the things, and he did the Mon Montreal Protocol, which was critical for fluorocarbons. He's done a lot in terms of providing for a cleaner water and cleaner air. But he has been very critical of the degree of regulation versus innovation. So the question is, what can be done by private industry in terms of developing new technologies to address these issues? And what is the role of regulation? Clearly, he and I both favor regulation. But the question is the balance between providing for the innovation versus the regulation, which prohibits the activity. Uh, Tony Thurman, you, uh, your district has uh, one of the biggest greenhouse gas emitters uh, of pollution in, in California, the Richmond refinery, the Chevron refinery. How concerned are you about relaxing environmental standards, which affects the air that your people breathe? Well, I'm very concerned about it. Uh, you know, and it's disturbing that anyone would question uh, the true science behind climate change. And even if you don't believe the science, you just have to pay attention uh, to what we're seeing all around us. And we see flooding. Um, we know that we're going to face sea level rise. We know that there are huge challenges. And for someone who has lived minutes away from a refinery, I've watched that refinery when it had a fire. I'm aware of the kind of danger that exists. There are children in my district who have some of the highest rates of hospitalization for asthma related to particulate matter in the air. And we cannot deny that there is a physical cost uh, to not acting. And I'm so proud of what we've done to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, in this state. And I think California can continue to lead in those areas. We monitor methane. Um, we're doing more. And, and it is a misnomer that, um, that restrictions are, are, are strangling economic development in the state. You know, as a, as a council member, I helped to start a job training program that focuses on solar panel installation in a construction job training program. We're seeing some of the fastest growth around renewable energy and clean tech opportunities. And I always say it, you know, we all want jobs, but we don't have to have jobs that are gonna kill us. And in California, we need to continue to promote the opportunity for clean tech and green tech jobs. Um, you know, and some things were said about our infrastructure that is crumbling. California, I believe that this is the year that we're gonna see something get done for our infrastructure and for our roads. But we've got to have a real serious conversation. The California state budget cannot handle the kind of costs that we need to take care of our roads without having a conversation about a possible increase in the gas tax and generating eight or nine billion dollars to work on the crumbling roads that are in Democratic and Republican areas. And so California is leading in infrastructure and we should continue to protect around these climate change issues. Tony Strickland, uh, there are more Americans now who work in the solar industry than ex extracting fossil fuels. So as a Republican, do you see promise in green tech or is it just hype? Now, absolutely. I, I voted for the uh, renewable energy standard when I was a legislator in Sacramento. I do believe that we are transitioning 
into a more green uh, technology. Uh, I believe that private enterprise has invested a lot of money along with public uh, into newer technologies. Um, but I also think that government and sometimes uh, creates regulations where the technology doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, things that CARB, the California Air Resources Board, tried to pass for these crane operators that were in my district in Santa Barbara, uh, they went to the hearing. They say, look, what you're asking for us to do as a government uh, saying that we have to meet these regulations, that technology doesn't exist. And the answer was, well, if we have these regulations, then someone will make it. What does that do to the person who's trying to create those jobs? Those cranes that cost seven, eight million dollars for those operators had to do a garage sale and, and send them over to Nevada. I believe there's a responsible way of doing it. And I also believe that we can work public and private together. I do believe in the renewable energy standard. I do believe that we can transition California into more of a renewable energy uh, technology. And that can be the model for the rest of the country. But to say that we're going to just flip it around in, in such a short time isn't isn't sensible. It just won't it won't happen. We are making strides. There's no question we're making strides and we can be the model for the rest of the country. Tony Strickland is a California chair of the pro Trump Super PAC uh, Committee for American Sovereignty. I'm Greg Dalton. This is Climate One. A while back, I interviewed uh, Marvin Odom. He's the president of Shell Oil Company, one of the largest oil companies in the world. And here's what he had to say about climate change. It's very clear for us as a company, and that is that climate change is real, um, that humans have an enormous impact on that, and that it requires some sort of action going forward. So we see it as a, as a big enough issue and a big enough risk the, to where we need that sort of global framework to then drive this market to somewhere different than it's headed right now. So that's Marvin Odom, president of Shell Oil Company. I want to roll another clip. Uh, this is former CEO of Goldman Sachs, Hank Paulson, secretary of the Treasury under George W. Bush. Climate change poses a massive threat to the world. It, it's a huge e economic risk, and like any other major economic risk, and I, I think this is the biggest economic risk the planet faces, climate uh, change deserves to be understood and managed as the risk that it is. Duff Sundheim, that's the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, head of an oil company, saying things that very few Republicans will say in America right now. Why is the Republican Party out of step with pillars of its support, Wall Street and energy companies? Well, it's, I can't speak for other Republicans. I mean, I agree with him. I agree with Steve Schmidt. I agree with Secretary Schultz. It's a major problem, and we need to move forward. And you have two Republicans on the stage that agree with that statement. So we are within our party, just as Tony mentioned, there are differences within the Democratic Party. We're fighting very hard to have those issues addressed. I think the major difference that we have with the two people on this stage is what is the balance. So I was in meetings with Governor Schwarzenegger where the leading energy producers would come in, and they'd say, Say, Governor, we're glad to do this or glad to do this, but we're told if we do do this, we're going to be sued. And we're told at the same time by this other agency, if we don't do this, we're going to be sued. So just tell us what we need to do. And that's the type of regulation that we're talking about, is just common sense regulation that addresses this issue because that's the balance we're trying to strike. And Tony and I have been working hard to find that balance because we do need cleaner air, we do need cleaner water, but at the same time we also have to understand that there's an economic earthquake in this state. We've seen the greatest accumulation of wealth in the history of civilization, but on the other side of that fault line there are 8.9 Californians living in poverty. There are more people living in poverty than there are people in 39 of the 50 states. So we just want to make sure as we make this transition, we take into account all those people that are being left out of the American dream. Tony Thurmond, is California's green push hurting poor people, working class people? Absolutely not. The jobs in the clean tech sector pay much better than any of the low paying jobs that, um, that often have been offered. And, you know, of course there is some restriction, but we also have a system like cap and trade that says, look, you can either reduce your greenhouse gas emissions or you provide money that's going to help offset the impacts to those communities that are negatively impacted uh, environmentally. And so there are opportunities to work with the business community. You know, I authored a bill that was signed by the governor that uh, puts higher fees on companies that have oil and gas leaks. 
We invited the industry to be at the table and have conversations. So when businesses are responsible and willing to work with us, we can do that. Uh, we want to support California businesses, but when they're doing the right thing. And too often, the argument from some Republicans and some business leaders is, we know it's the right thing to do, but it just costs too much money. Well, we're saying, what's the cost to not act? And so we're happy to have those conversations. We want to support California business, but we cannot put our head in the sand and say that climate change is not real or because it costs too much to address it. We're not going to do anything. Michael Bloomberg and others, uh, Hank Paulson, did a whole project on the cost of inaction. There's often the cost, well, we can't do something because it'll cost too much, or there's a cost of doing nothing. Uh, we're talking about climate change and the new administration at Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. My guests are Democratic strategist Christine Pelosi, Duff Sundheim, former chair of the Republican Party in California, Tony Strickland is a former member of the California State Legislature and chair of a pro-Trump super PAC, and Tony Thurman, you just heard from, is a member of the California State Legislature. We're we're going to go to our lightning round, a series of true or false questions for our guest today, uh, beginning with uh, Duff Suntime. True or false, gay marriage is settled law in the United States. True. Christine Pelosi, Hillary Clinton's campaign showed hubris and entitlement. True. Tony Strickland, Joe Biden would have beaten Donald Trump in a landslide. True. <laughs> uh, Tony Thurman, Ku Klux Klan support for Donald Trump is deeply troubling. True. Duff sometime, the Electoral College should be reformed so electoral votes are aligned with popular votes in each state. Within each state? So, so keeping the Electoral College but getting rid of these electoral... Winner take all. Make, make it proportional. Per state. Because, so I'm not for the popular vote, but I'm for getting rid of the Electoral College and going, so California... So like a congressional district type system that some other states. Yes. I'll, I'll Only if you out. had universal nonpartisan redistricting commissions. I'm for those two and supported and, that in California and support it nationwide. Sorry. And, yeah, that's no, that's fine. <laughs> it, it's uh, actually we found some areas of agreement there in terms of uh, reforming uh, and protecting the democracy. Uh, Christine Pelosi, the next two years will be your mother's last as leader of the Democratic House Democrats. False. Uh, Tony Strickland. You that would have been a story if you said otherwise. <laughs> was, that would have been a front page story. I uh, got to try. Uh, Tony Strickland, you watch MSNBC at least once a week. Absolutely. True. Uh, Every day. Uh, Christine Pelosi, you watch Fox News at least once a week. True. Uh, Duff Sundheim, burning fossil fuels contributes to rising seas and temperatures. True. Uh, Tony Strickland, carbon pollution contributes to climate change. True. Uh, Duff Sundheim, you have slept with a Democrat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> she is, um, <laughs> wow. Just she say does true. Not, she does not uh, indicate her, she's an independent voter. <laughs> Fair background here. You worked with Arnold Schwarzenegger, who used to often talk about how he, he did that. Um, you're you're uh, trying to get me in trouble here. Nah, uh, <laughs> wow. Now that Fair, would have been a story. <laughs> and, she, and, she, and she's sitting in the second row. So. Uh, <laughs> hi, honey. That's funny. Uh, Christine Pelosi, you've slept with a Republican. False. <laughs> <laughs> So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. That's not a story. In my uh, next life, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> happily married. Uh, Tony Thurman, California's drift toward one party rule is unhealthy for its democracy. Ooh. False. In the current sense. <laughs> um, Duff Sundheim, Donald Trump is the only elected leader, world leader, who publicly doubts that human activity is changing the climate. Recent comments, not clear. I think he's showing that he's open to new ideas in that area. He's the only one who's tweeted it, put it that way. That's, yeah, the only one who's, yeah. Um, uh, Tony Strickland, Republicans are afraid to stand up to, stand up to Trump for fear of reprisals. False. Tony Thurmond, uh, California's Climate action, you, you answered this. Climate action has raised energy prices and hurt low-income people. Absolutely false. Uh, Duff Sundheim, are more Republican men in the gay closet or the climate closet? <laughs> <laughs> you get good ones. He's getting all the good questions. <laughs> well, d d I think that the gay issue is pretty much settled. So I would say, by default, more in the climate. Okay. Um, 
Christine Pelosi, federal earmarks were useful lubricants for getting deals done in Congress, and they should be revived. False. Uh, Tony Thurman, Democratic politicians should spend less time sipping Chardonnay on verandas with well-heeled donors and more time drinking beer in dive bars. Well, I don't drink Chardonnay. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say false. Can um, we say true because we'd have campaign finance reform and we wouldn't have to drink with any donors? Well, I'm saying false to the implication that Democrats aren't serving the people and they're just sitting around drinking with donors. So that's okay. there you go. why I'm okay. false. Uh, this is, a, uh, mentioned a statement yeah. and want to ask from each of our guests, uh, two or three words, first words that pop into your mind. Uh, Christine Pelosi, uh, Donald Trump banning, oh, this is Donald Trump's statement. So I'm gonna ask each of our guests, I'll mention a Donald Trump statement and get their immediate response, the first two or three words that come to their mind. Christine Pelosi, Donald Trump banning lobbyists from his cabinet. A false promise. Uh, Duff Sundheim, uh, breaking with 65 years of bipartisan uh, tradition and appointing a military officer, James Mattis, as Secretary of Defense. Great move, historic move. Uh, even though it will require a changing federal law because we want to have, there's a tradition of civilian control of the military in this country. Uh, Donald, uh, Tony Strickland, uh, Donald Trump's statement to Billy Bush that he sexually assaults women. False. Tony Thurman, uh, Donald Trump's plan to have Muslims register. It's shameful behavior that doesn't belong in our country. That's the end of our lightning round. Let's give them a, a round of applause for... <laughs> We're getting through that. Um, Tony Strickland, uh, there's, let's look to the California governor's race in two years. Uh, there's an interesting mayor in San Diego, uh, Kevin Faulkner, um, Navy Town, so, so more conservative part of California. He came out with a climate action plan, something that uh, no member of Congress has been since John McCain 10 years ago has dared to do. What does that say about the politics of the future of uh, climate and the Republican Party in California? Well, uh, Kevin Faulkner uh, is one of the very few Republicans that represent a big city. Um, and so I, I think he's a, a star within our party. Uh, if I was advising him, I would advise him not to run for governor. Um, I think that we as Republicans didn't get here overnight, and I think it'd be very difficult for any Republican to get across the finish line. And we have to look from within and figure out, look, we, we lost Orange County uh, when we used to win a million votes, when I say we, Republican Party. Um, but you know, we have to go around the state and um, do whatever we can. I would hate to see uh, Mayor Faulkner run and, and, and get beat uh, by a huge margin because I think he should be looked at as someone that can go into the administration uh, later on down the line after he's termed out. I think he loves his job. He's doing a great job as mayor of San Diego. Does sometimes, who's on the bench for Republicans in California? I mean, is the party slipping into irrelevance? I mean, we just heard someone's, one of the stars, we heard, just heard Tony Strickland say to one of the stars, don't run. Well, we have the same problem in California that a lot of people think the Democrats have nationally. I would say the people that I'm very impressed with, in addition to Kevin Faulkner, the mayor of, uh, who just stepped down in Fresno, mm -hmm. Ashley Schweringen is a real star. Uh, right in East Bay, Catherine Baker is a future star. Absolutely. So we do have people that are coming up, but clearly there is uh, a lack of leadership on the Republican side here in California. Christine Pelosi, how about fresh faces? You mentioned some earlier, fresh faces uh, in, uh, you know, the, the rising stars in the Democratic Party, either California or nationally. Well, obviously, uh, Kamala Harris, our brand new U.S. senator, will make it be effective from the start. Uh, nobody can fill Barbara Boxer's shoes, but she will uh, she will be a tremendous leader and a force in her own right. Uh, I think uh, she's a she's a rising star. Linda Sanchez, newly elected vice chair of the uh, House Democratic Caucus, first woman of color to be a, in the leadership of either caucus, Republican or Democratic, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, she is terrific. She was. Uh, woman. Oh, that's right. She said she, woman. She, woman. She said woman. Woman of color. Well, I'm sorry, woman of color. Right, because yeah. I thought um, you said person of color. No, because uh, Mr. Clyburn 
uh, on the Democratic side was the first African American uh, chair. But yes, a woman of color. But uh, so Linda Sanchez, um, you were talking about from California, who we're exporting, mm. or or nationally, or, other, na or nationally. Nationally. Eric Swalwell. Uh, look, I think we have a we have a very a terrific and exciting bench. Look at the people who were just out campaigning around the country. Uh, and, and many of whom stopped in California. I think when we look at the, looking ahead at our race for Democratic National Committee chair, you see Keith Ellison making an impact, and Jamie Harrison, the state chair from South Carolina, uh, who's terrific, grew up in rural South Carolina, went to work on the Hill for Mr. Clyburn, then went home to run his state party, and is now running for national chair. Jamie Harrison is his name, he's terrific, and of course, um, Cory Booker and Amy Klobuchar are two senators who we might see on the presidential uh, campaign circuit. Uh, Wonderful uh, veteran was Secretary of State, ran and barely, barely lost a Senate race, uh, uh, Cander from Missouri, who's heading to Iowa to, to make a speech soon. I don't know why that would be, but all we'll right, find out. Right. It's happening already. But uh, Christine Pelosi, uh, Democrats control Congress, the, the president, the White House, and most of the state houses and governorships in the country. It's a very red country right now. I mean, Republicans. Yeah, sorry, sorry, the Republicans. Democrats yeah, Republicans. Republicans control uh, the White House, Congress, and what, two, three-fifths of the state legislatures and governorships. That's a pretty tough field for Democrats. Well, I will say this. As a member of the Democratic National Committee, I'm heading to um, the next couple of months we'll be making a decision on a new chair. And I've made it clear to all the candidates who are running who have called me to ask for my support and my vote that we need to have a reform and a revival. Now, I'm a super delegate, as you mentioned, but I'm a super delegate who campaigned for re-election on a campaign of eliminating my superpowers, uh, because I don't think that, um, pardon the pun, we should trump the will of the voters. <laughs> so I, I have been you know, on that track for eight years. Bernie Sanders joined us a year ago, so we have a little more push for that. But I think we need to reform the Democratic Party from within in terms of making little d Democratic reforms. And I've done campaign boot camps in 41 states around the country over 10 years. So I've been part of building the bench, but we need to commit to doing more of that. And when it comes to the money, part of the reason I think Democrats are losing races is that our party used to be the convener. When I was a young Democrat and running the state party as the executive director, we were the convener and everybody came to the party. Now, post Citizens United, but it started before that, um, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party per se, they do a little bit, but it's mostly the super PACs who have the most influence. And so if you want to restore the Democratic Party and the Republican Party for that matter, I think what you really need is to overturn Citizens United. You need to kick out the super PACs and say, we're gonna start with members of the party build those people up, and then we'll go out and build coalitions, and, and these groups should all have, have seats at the table, but you have to start with revitalizing the Democratic Party and saying we're gonna make people-based decisions and not donor-based decisions. I agree with everything. I think I agree with everything you said. The one thing I would add is that the role Obama played in 2008 of undermining the federal uh, election system that we had in place, where he committed to live by the constraints and then decided to go against those constraints. And I think that also had a material effect, in addition to everything else. That well, you actually, said. I would say it was a different decision. I think it was a decision to do OFA and not put that into the DNC. Okay. which was the cannibalization. Uh, uh, organizing for America, that's some inside baseball there. Uh, Tony Strickland, you headed a super PAC. Yeah. Are you in favor of doing away with super PACs? Uh, let, let's just look at if money was the difference, Hillary Clinton would have been president of the United States. I mean, she outspent Donald Trump tremendously in super PAC money, party money, money into their campaign. So if money was the key of winning, she would have won a landslide. He so, got tons of free, free No, but it's media. the kind of money that you're spending. Priorities USA wasn't talking about an economic message. They were talking about the Billy Bush tapes. So okay, well, it was the Democratic if, Party. If, if the Democratic Party spent about their money uh, not well, wisely, I mean, I that's an issue that you have to deal with. But at the end of the day, Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party and the super PACs on the Democratic side dramatically, dramatically, it wasn't even close, outspent the Republicans. Um, I'm, I'm one that says that you have to have a message that appeals 
and you can have less money. You just got to be in the ballpark. But you have to actually go out and reach out and talk to people eye to eye. I think one of the big reasons why Hillary Clinton lost is she stayed in Brooklyn. She didn't talk to individuals. She didn't talk to voters. You asked me the question about Joe Biden. Joe Biden's life story is an unbelievable life story. He connected with people in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He would have connected with people in Michigan. Hillary did not go and connect. She stayed in her campaign headquarters. She lost because she did not identify those economic issues that people were starving for in those swing states. And it wasn't money. It was the lack of a message and lack of a candidate and a campaign. Christine Pelosi, some truth in that? Well, again, I think, I think two things. First of all, I'm, I'm a fan of show up everywhere. I mean, I was the original person who asked the question in 2004 to the then Democratic National Committee chair aspirants, what is your 50 state, 447 member strategy to unite the Democratic Party? Um, the 50 state strategy question was answered best by Howard Dean, which was put the money back in the states. So he got elected. So I'm a big fan in showing up everywhere. I do think ready for Hillary was a 50 state strategy. And I think the campaign did a lot of good work. My complaint was there weren't enough debates. Um, I wanted more debates. We fought for more debates. There weren't enough. I think that the campaign protected Hillary from herself you mean in the to her peril. In the primary, there and were not enough the, the debates. And every week we could have had a Democratic debate. Hillary Clinton should have, could have shown her stuff, showed how smart she was. Bernie could have shown more of himself, the other people too. But when you only have five debates and the Republicans are having something like 18, guess who gets 18 news cycles and gets who gets five? But that so was Debbie that Wasserman was, Schultz protecting Hillary on the, the DNC. And it was a mistake. And it was a mistake that, that many of us called out a year ago. I want to say one thing. I, believe, I do believe that having that economic message and showing up is critical. I was introducing Keith Ellison recently to my California Democratic Party Women's Caucus, and I said, he and I have something in common, because in, ju in July of 2015, we were both sneered at on national television for saying Donald Trump could win the nomination. I was sneered at, he was laughed at, two different networks, but within three days of each other. But we saw something in Donald Trump and the aspirational message. And I think that's what's the most frustrating. And as I told y'all backstage, I told you so was not a strategy, but I did tell them so. <laughs> um, so I gotta find different people to tell. But the reality is, it's always the economy. That is always what people are voting on. When you're talking about climate, you're talking about pollution, you're talking about health, it comes down to the pocketbook. Poverty is expensive. School is expensive. Go student loan debt, meaning that you have to defer the job you really want that you got the education for, that's expensive. Um, it, housing is expensive. The two biggest donors in San Francisco to the supervisor races, super PACs, were Airbnb and Uber. So everybody the world over, they want to talk about coastal elites, but we're not living in an elite situation here in, in San Francisco in terms of, of, of lacking a lower middle class and lacking my daughter's public school teachers can't afford to live in San Francisco. So we have a problem if we're not talking about those issues and instead we're talking about the sexy issues of the day. And I think that's where Democrats really need to get real with ourselves. And Republicans, if you're gonna beat us in California, need to be able to do that too. By the well, way, I, in I, California, we are doing a teacher Tony housing Tony. bill this year. We're gonna have a major housing bill because of the lack of affordability in California. I agree with Ms. Pelosi. If we took all the money that's been in all these independent expenditures and put it towards something like education, where California still ranks 41st in the nation in per pupil spending, if we put that money in the right place. And by the way, President Obama showed that you can win with small donations. He largely won with very small donations. When you looked at the number of donations that he ultimately won, he, he showed that there was a path He to won doing Wall that. Street. Wall Street funded his campaign. As his campaign got underway, it was $15 donations and $25 at the beginning, donations absolutely. in mass mm -hmm. and engaging people who hadn't ever voted before. Mm -hmm. And so if we make money less about the conversation and more a conversation about what the people of America want. I we'll want to get, get the uh, audience in on the question. If you're just joining us, we're talking about climate change and clean energy in California, the new administration. I'm Greg Dalton. My guests are Duff Sundheim, former chair of the California Republican Party. You just heard from T Tony Thurman, member of the California State Legislature, Christine Pelosi, Democratic strategist and superdelegate, and Tony Strickland, who chaired a California pro-Trump super PAC we're going to invite you to participate uh, at the microphone over there. We have 14 minutes left. Uh, I invite you to join us with a one, one part comment or question. I'm here to help you uh, keep it brief. If you need that help, I'm here for you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, welcome your participation. 
And please go there now so we can get the line formed and if we're crossing the cameras. You know that we record this for our TV show and podcast and radio program. So let's go to our audience questions. Welcome. Sure. Um, thanks. So to Mr. Um, Sondheim, you gave a really eloquent discussion uh, on, on climate and the nuances between Republicans and Democrats in California. And Mr. Dalton asked you as poignantly as, you, as he could the disconnect that I just don't understand. So try and explain it simply since this is all about communication. Sure. Why can't mainstream Republicans from Mitch McConnell on down just accept climate change? Say exactly what you said. We have a different view of how to get to it, whether it be regulation, innovation, all the things I might add that California has done. And I say this is somebody who worked in Washington in the 80s when acid rain was being debated. Tell me how, why they are so frightened to even say it. That's on time. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that question um, other than that's a discussion that Tony and I have. And I think that we're making progress in that. And I think that, again, you're seeing it even in the uh, Trump administration where they started out with, you know, a very flat statement and they're being much more nuanced. So the thing about this administration, again, if you have the evidence, I think you're going to be able to make your case. And that's what we're going to continue to try to do. Christine Pelosi, uh, some people say that the answer to that question is partly money, uh, fossil fuel funding. Uh, California Democrats recently said they're not going to take money from fossil fuel companies. Is that going to hurt? It's going to help. I think it's a terrific idea. I wish that our legislators um, individually wouldn't take that money either, because I think the worry um, is not that we're sliding into one party rule in California. I think what you're going to see in the legislature are you're going to have progressive Democrats versus the so-called mod squads right. um, who are getting money from big business. That's what hurt us on some of our climate efforts earlier this year. So yes, it's the money. If you're the Koch brothers and you have shale oil investments that are worth billions and billions of dollars, then given even one billion dollars in campaign contributions to protect that is a very successful return on investment. And that's why you have to clean up polluted politics by cleaning up the, the ability for unlimited money to be spent and showered on these legislators. By the and way, I, and I, I, think, I think that's a good answer to the question that you asked. I mean, there are people that are tied, whether it's coal or oil, and they're tied to those industries, and so it's a matter of self-interest. So I think uh, that's uh, I was merely going to add to your wish list that legislators wouldn't take oil money. You're sitting next to one of them. I think there are many of us in the state as well, and I totally agree who with do you, not. Thank who you. do not take oil money. Thank Appreciate you. you. So Tony Thurman, just to clarify, you uh, represent a district where there's a big oil refinery and you don't take money from that oil company? Absolutely not. Uh, I've made that a statement of my politics that um, in my campaign, we welcome um, anyone to contribute, but we don't take contributions from oil companies, from tobacco. Um, we believe that those who cause harm in the community should be taxed to help offset those harms. And that's the position that we take. Well, as much as you know, I kind of take the middle road here, I, I don't believe Fossil fuel companies, their primary thing is to harm the community. I mean, they provide the gas that we need, to, frankly, that enabled me to get here. And so while I am all for transitioning to sustainable energy policy, I do not view the people that provide us with that energy today, oil companies, as bad people. They need to act responsibly. They need to act very responsibly in the Richmond area. But I still think that to demonize people that are involved in that industry that supply something that is so essential to our way of life. Uh, I have a little trouble with I that. I don't think he demonized them. I think he just said they should pay more and, money to offset their harm. And I'm not gonna, uh, the assemblyman's an honorable person. I just met him. But um, I will say I have served with legislators who say I'm not taking X money. I'm not taking X money, whatever it is, tobacco, oil, whatever it is, HMOs. Uh, but what they do to get around it is they ask them to give to the party and then right. the party gives it to them. I'm not saying it's the assemblyman. I'm saying a lot of times uh, people say something publicly and do something different uh, down the line. And that, Shocking. My, yes. that's been my frustration. <laughs> Look, for whatever you know, reason, tobacco companies and oil companies don't even talk to me. So you can well, be sure no, no, no. <laughs> that I'm not <laughs> asking them. I'll, I'll, I will tell you, the California right. Democratic Party gets a lot of money from That's the correct. tobacco companies, a, a lot fact. more than Republicans do. That's a true fact. A lot more of the gas companies and oil companies give more to the California Democratic Party than the Republican Party. And, you know, and again, that's not a, a cast aspersion. No. I'm just saying that's not consistent because I've seen many colleagues of mine 
do that. Well, let's, and let's my, go to our my next, um, has a let's, let's go to our next question. Okay. Here, welcome. Hi, uh, Richard Winger. If you look at the California Secretary of State election returns tonight, it's now showing two million people turned out to vote, voted for president, did not vote for U.S. Senate. I feel that giving candidates, so few candidates on the general election ballot is a harm to the voters. Meanwhile, Maine just passed instant runoff voting mm -hmm. for their state and federal elections, and I wish you would each comment about can't we have a better election system in California? Duff Sundheim, you were instrumental in reforming the election system in California, top two uh, uh, system and redistricting. And I was most directly and adversely affected by that. <laughs> well, there you have it. <laughs> you <screwed> yourself. <laughs> yeah. And uh, because I don't know if you know, but I received 67% more votes than any other Republican. So under the old system, it would have been Kamala Harris and I in the fall. But since I supported the top two primary, it had a negative effect. As long as people don't vote in June in large numbers, you're absolutely right. And the question is whether the people are going to understand just what's at stake in the June elections and show up in the June elections. Because if you do that, then you will have a wide variety of choices. But not only are there a lot of Republicans that are having second thoughts about that, I know the people on the Democratic side also don't like it because they spend so much money campaigning against each other. I, I spoke against it on the floor of the Senate when that passed, and I thought it was a horrible idea. I think it disenfranchising, disenfranchises voters in different pockets of the state. Um, you know, you will have, I believe in the gubernatorial cycle, most likely unless Kevin Faulkner runs, you're gonna probably have two Democrats that run against each other. Spending a ton uh, of money. And, and they'll spend a lot, of, uh, and, and they're gonna look at, oh, are Republicans gonna do that? And there's little pockets, not many, in the state where you have two Republicans run against each other in a legislative race. I don't think that's healthy. I, I, I think we need ideas. In fact, when we pass this, Small parties, like the Green Party, for example, had ideas. You know, they might not have won. There was one that I served with named Audie Bach, but they might not have won, but they brought ideas to the table. And all those third party candidates, gone. They don't have any voice whatsoever. And a lot of times you end up having two of the people that almost are identical in terms of ideas. I would like more voter participation. And if there's no one out there that is out there speaking what you believe, um, you know, it, it makes it very difficult. I actually ran in a race for Congress where two Republicans made it to the runoff. Um, I, and I had a lot of Democratic support. I think one of the reasons why I lost is I had four Democratic speakers endorse my campaign. They used that <laughs> against me saying, look, Tony's a liberal. And no one's ever called me a liberal in my entire life. <laughs> Before or since. Right? Oh, in California. We're talking about uh, politics in California. Let's go to our next audience question. Welcome. Uh, yes, I have a question for Christine Pelosi. Um, how do you think the election results would have been different if Republican legislators and governors hadn't passed restrictive voter ID laws that kept hundreds of thousands of people from voting who were actually qualified to vote? I think the Democrats would have won. Full stop. I've been a very strong advocate for voting rights, and I think it's, it, we really, if we're going to amend the Constitution, we ought to think about a constitutional right to vote, enshrining that, and I... It is heartbreaking when you hear stories of people who, unlike what this gentleman was talking about, who actually want to vote and don't have the opportunity to do so. So whether you're talking about African Americans or Native Americans who were born not in hospitals, whether you're talking about um, homesteaders who weren't born in hospitals who, who don't have the opportunity to vote, or whether you're talking about people who are allowed to vote with a hunting license but not a student ID, there's a lot of voter ID out there. It, they ought to have a uniform law across the country. And I would just say one thing. After 9-11, one of the 9-11 reforms that was suggested was a universal ID. And the reason that a lot of Democrats were against it is we said, no, we want to do immigration reform first, and then we'll get to that. I mean, some libertarians are never for it, <laughs> but the majority of the people said, let's do immigration reform, and then we can get to universal voter ID like they have in South Africa. So you have to do immigration reform first, and then you could have a universal ID, and I think a lot more people, as Yogi Berra famously said, if the fans aren't coming to the ballpark, how are you going to stop them? If the voters are staying home, how are we going to stop them, right? We have to give them more choices, more issues that relate to them, and fewer restrictions on voting. Let's go to our next question. Welcome. Hello. Uh, this question is for Tony Strickland, mainly because I disagreed with you the most on stage. <laughs> um, so like many Californians in this room, I was shocked when Trump won, won 
And how do we as Californians eliminate the enclaves in American society? How do we shake the coastal elite reputation and connect with the rest of the nation? Tony Strickland. Well, you know, um, I, I think it's important um, to connect with, we have a diverse country. Look, I was Mitt Romney's California chair both in eight and 12, spent a lot of time with Governor Romney traveling this country. People in Texas are far different. They have different life experiences than people in California, than people in Alabama, than people in New York. The greatness of this country is we are diverse. Um, and, but you have to understand that you have to have a candidate that can fit anywhere else. And let me talk to you uh, what I mean. In my lifetime, I think the two best elected presidents uh, that fit that mold are Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan. Let me give you an example. You could go from Wall Street to Hollywood, to the South, to the Midwest Union steel town, and Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan would fit in wherever you went. And I don't think that that was the case of the two candidates that we had, but I will say in the swing states, in that Rust Belt, uh, Donald Trump was able to connect and unlike you, I thought Donald Trump had a shot. I thought it was an inside straight, but I always thought he had a shot at winning the presidential race. And I knew it came down to flipping a democratic state, but also making sure that Obama won Florida, Virginia, and Ohio both times. We had to win, I knew Virginia was gone when we talked about the presidential race, but Florida and Ohio, I felt very confident that Donald Trump was gonna win those two states. I was saying, what, what other state can he do? And, and campaigning wise, um, Joe Biden would have done far better in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, obviously. And Hillary Clinton just did not connect to, to those voters in those states. Let's go to our next question, welcome. Uh, one of the past members of the uh, CIA was interviewed on a television program, and he mentioned that um, uh, a portion of white America is afraid of the browning of America. And after Donald Trump's election, we had right, white nationalists in Washington, D.C. doing high Hitler salutes. Does the, Repar does the Republican leadership have any responsible, uh, responsible re uh, you know, response to that? And should you address people of color who are now fearful in this country? Does the Republican Party need to step up to that? I think we need you to use this sure. mic, please. Sorry. Absolutely, and I will go wherever you want me to go to make that statement. I'm saying here publicly that has no place, not only in the Republican Party, but in our political process. Well, Donald Trump I, renounced it himself. And, so, and he you did know, in 60 minutes, yeah. but we and need to do it continually. Correct. You know, it's kind of like when I have an argument with my spouse. I mean, it, you know, when they're upset, it, you, can, you, you have to listen. And people are genuinely upset. So we need, our responsibility is as being part of the party that won the election is to sit and listen and to work with you until you're comfortable. That's our responsibility. Uh, and until that happens, we haven't fulfilled that responsibility. I, I would agree with you, Tony Thurman. that there, there needs to be from the Republican Party. I, sorry, the, the, sorry the, the mic, we just need Duff to use there, that. There's one. a need to works? disavow the things that we have been hearing um, in the public since the election. The uh, Southern Poverty Law Center has said there's been some 700 some uh, hate crime incidents reported just since the election. Uh, sadly, uh, a young man in my district was killed, an African-American man was shot and killed by three white men and is being investigated and reported as a hate crime. There's something about Mr. Trump's election that has sent a message to those who apparently have felt this way to be emboldened that they can now say these things publicly. And I agree with you. We need everyone to disavow these kinds of statements and to talk about hate is not accepted. We need to strengthen our relationships. We need Mr. Trump to do that. We need the Republican Party to do that, the Democratic Party to do that, everyone together. And some of this is related to some of the policy things that Mr. Mm -hmm. Trump talked about mm -hmm. during the campaign, making statements about, about Muslims, making statements about you know, immigrants, building the wall. All of these things have had a toll on our communities, and we have to rebuild the fabric of our communities. And we, I agree with you, the Republican Party has a responsibility to help with that rebuilding. Let's go to our last audience question, welcome. Hi, um, this question is, Mr. Th is for Mr. Thurmond. Um, so you mentioned that right now in construction job training that there's solar panel installation trainings as well. Um, and I was just wondering, like, since, um, as Ms. Pelosi said, that people vote um, by their like personal pocketbook, and 
Climate change is also an undeniable threat, and so it seems like one of the best solutions is to retrain workers who are currently in the fossil fuel in industry to work in clean tech. And my question for you is, what are the biggest roadblocks right now to having um, like more widespread and robust retraining programs, and what can um, like lay people, like activists do, to like empower their local representatives to get that kind of um, funding. Thank you. There was the only time climate came up in the debates was a guy who works at a coal plant. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to the gridlock in Congress, the federal government has reduced the amount of money that we get for our workforce development programs, and those are exactly the dollars that we use to train and retrain individuals. Um, we've got a great community college system um, that really can help to prepare people for you know, um, sectors that are really seeing growth. Um, you know, clean tech is seeing growth, um, technology. We've got to start working with our students while they're in school to make sure that they get access to all the computer science training that they can. We're going to see maybe a million jobs in coding that could go unfilled in California because we're not preparing our students to be that workforce of tomorrow. Uh, these things require dollars uh, to provide that training. And quite frankly, we've got to also consider that there are roadblocks in the way of the, of the candidates who often can't get to the training, um, whether or not they've been formally incarcerated and there aren't re-entry programs to help them, um, whether or not they've struggled in school and they, they need more support to be prepared to take those jobs. These are the kinds of things that we're working on in the legislature. We've, we've put more money into our community colleges, into our apprenticeship training programs, so that when we have um, a, a transportation package, uh, that money can go to creating good paying jobs for individuals who can work in them and have the training. And we're committed to doing more of that here in California. Before we uh, wrap, I want to ask two things uh, of the audience. One is to give a round of applause to the great Climate One crew who's been making this event happen. <laughs> uh, fantastic people. And after I close out the program for the radio program and podcast, I encourage you, as we, uh, Kelly said at the beginning, to talk to someone here that you don't know. Uh, you have your name cards and someone who might have something different, uh, to th learn something with an open mind to, to meet some new people here. We have some sandwiches in the back. Each of the speakers have uh, a cocktail table in the back with their name on them. You can go there. They will go there afterwards. Or you can talk with them uh, without me in the way and have a conversation uh, with them for the next 20 minutes or so. So we have to end it there. We've been talking about clean energy and California, the new political administration. I'm Greg Dalton. My guests have been, guests have been Duff Sundheim, former chairman of the California GOP, Tony Strickland, California, <clears throat> Tony Strickland, California chair of a pro-Trump super PAC, the Committee for American Sovereignty, Tony Thurman, California legislator, Democratic from the San Francisco Bay Area, and Christine Pelosi, Democratic strategist. I'd like to thank our audience here at the Commonwealth Club and those listening online and on air. You can join the conversation on Twitter using our handle at Climate One at the Commonwealth Club. So I'd like to thank you all and thank our guests today for joining us.